Welcome to Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and as always, thanks for watching. Well, how COVID is affecting emergency care, but first, the election investigations continue, and we'll get to those subjects following these words. Welcome to the fast-paced and unrehearsed weekly discussion featuring the leaders who help shape your world. Join us as we address the issues that impact you each and every day. This is Pennsylvania Newsmakers, and now, here's your host, Terry Madonna. Well, John Meisick joins me. He's the editor-in-chief of Pennsylvania Capital Star, and he knows a good bit about uh, a whole bunch of subjects, the U.S. Senate race, redistricting, and elections investigations. Well, let's start with the last point I made. It seems like these investigations don't end. <laughs> <laughs> They literally have going on and on and on. Yeah, I mean, Terry, as we sit here today, it's been 13 months since the November 2020 general election. Uh, there's, you, you feel like saying it over and over and over again, Joe Biden decisively won Pennsylvania by more than 80,000 votes. There's no evidence of any substantial fraud uh, that would have materially affected the outcome, yet President Donald Trump and his Republican lieutenants, including U.S. Rep. Scott Perry, uh, continue to push this false narrative um, about the election being stolen, uh, about uh, about the election somehow being illegitimate. Um, here in the Pennsylvania State Senate, um, a rarely used panel called the Senate Intergovernmental Operations Committee, chaired by Senator Chris Dush from Jefferson County, um, is plunging ahead with what it says is an investigation of the 2020 election and the 2021 primary, they claim this is not to reinstate President Trump, right. former President Deal Trump. Deal with the irregularities, right? To look into irregularities, they claim it's not to reinstate President Trump to office. Um, they are nonetheless seeking detailed personal information of more than 9 million Pennsylvania voters, including their driver's license numbers and partial, partial social security numbers. Uh, last, no, about a week and a half ago, that a, a challenge to that, uh, to that quest went before the state Commonwealth Court. Uh, we are now still awaiting the uh, result of that challenge. I'll tell you something. Given the debate over mail-in voting, I don't think there's any reason why the legislature shouldn't review. I'm not talking about widespread corruption. I'm talking about review the process that we use for mail-in voting to see if it can be strengthened to see if there are changes that should be made. Uh, drop in the mailbox, you know, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, things going on that, I, I, is there any reason why they shouldn't at least look into that for the reasons of making mail-in voting better? I mean, th I mean this, is, this is a completely superfluous review. The Department of State has already con con uh, conducted its, its own internal audits. Uh, county level audits have showed no evidence of fraud. There's a, uh, an omnibus, omnibus bill working its way through the General Assembly right now that would address some of those concerns you raise about yeah. mail-in voting, yeah. uh, notably what's known as pre-canvassing. That's the amount of time that counties have to open those mail-in ballots, sure. uh, but not actually count them before Election Day. Yeah. Uh, there's debates over drop-off boxes and that kind of stuff. Um, but this undertaking by, this, by the Senate, uh, yeah. spearheaded by Republicans, not supported by Democrats, is entirely yeah. partisan and entirely superfluous. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you make a good point. And given the debate, I mean, I think there are processes that could be improved. Again, mail-in voting is staying. It was passed in a bipartisan fashion. But make no mistake about it, the Democrats took advantage of it more than Republicans, and their voters turned out more by mail than Republicans did. So I certainly understand the need to take a look at changes that could be made, and there's certainly nothing wrong. But as you point out, those changes are already in the works, correct? Well, Republicans got I should stress that Republicans also were reelected by mail-in ballots, which makes yes. their objections yes. to this sort of laughable. Yes. They're looking to repeal it. They're looking to ban it. Um, they, too, were reelected and didn't seem to have much of an issue with mail-in balloting. So, you know, I don't take that argument particularly seriously. Yeah, well, we'll have to see how it all turns out. All right, well, let's do this. Let's run to a break. and we come back, I want to talk about a couple of important subjects. We'll take a look at the U.S. Senate race, which is not arguably going to be one of the most watched Senate elections in the country. And it could decide which party controls the Senate, yes or no? Absolutely. And where it goes remains to be seen. I'll tell you, as I say about the governor's race, and I repeat this every time we bring it up, I need the list in front of me, or I couldn't begin to repeat all the names. Oh, it's it, you need a scorecard for, uh, for this one, no doubt. I like the way you put that. All right, 
Pennsylvania's U.S. Senate race after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is presented by the Pennsylvania Chamber of Business and Industry, the statewide voice of business, and by the Pennsylvania State Education Association, bringing the power of a great education to our schools, our students, and our communities. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Highway Information Association, the go-to source to learn about transportation projects and issues. Please visit pahighwayinfo.org. And by the Pennsylvania Manufacturers Association. Business in Pennsylvania is our business. Well, John Meisig, are we every week, if not every day, going to be talking about Pennsylvania's U.S. Senate race? As I keep saying about the governor's race, I need the list in front of me or I have no clue. All the candidates are running. We know some of the big, you know, the names of people that are more familiar, but there's some that aren't familiar. Yeah, I am reminded that line from Jaws, uh, Terry, that we're going to need a bigger boat uh, to accommodate um, <laughs> right. all of these candidates. It's a wide open field on both the Democratic and Republican side of the ledger. Um, as something like a, maybe two dozen candidates on both sides are yeah. vying to replace uh, former U.S. or sorry, soon to be former uh, Republican U.S. I'm not going to retire him yet. Uh, yeah. Pat Toomey, he's, who's retiring at uh, at years end. Um, you know, just over on the Democratic side, you have Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, uh, U.S. Rep. Connor Lamb, the Montgomery County Commissioner Valerie Arcouche, um, and State Representative Malcolm Kenyatta in kind of the upper tier of candidates. Um, on the Republican side, things are a little bit more fluid with the exit of Sean Parnell, who was sort of the... I, I dislike using the word front runner because it's kind of meaningless at this early stage. Sure, but he, sure. you know, he sort of had most favored nation status. He had the endorsement of President Donald yeah, Trump. Before, before you go on, I got to ask you yes. about on the Republican side, the entrance of several people who aren't, haven't been Pennsylvania residents for some time, but who are very wealthy and are going to be able to fund. We have Dr. Oz. We have uh, everybody knows him. I don't have to get into his bio. Then we have Carla Sands. Mm -hmm. who was an actress, an, an actress and what, Trump's uh, ambassador to Denmark. And then we have Richard McCormick, mm -hmm. whose dad, by the way, was the chancellor of the state system and the former president. Of, and they all have plenty of money. Go yeah, that's, ahead. That's David McCormick, the David son McCormick, of the former right. chancellor. Uh, yeah, Ms. Ms. Sands has established, lived in California, has established residency in Cumberland County. It's a lot dodgier for Dr. Mehmet Oz, the sort of celebrity uh, CNN doctor who has lived in New Jersey but does not have Pennsylvania residency, is looking around for Mr. McCormick, I guess, has bought a house. Um, somewhere in Pittsburgh and is looking to move hearth and home. All three are pretty spectacularly wealthy and can probably self-fund to a greater or lesser extent. I mean, th I mean, this goes again, Terry, as I was saying a moment ago, to sort of the fluidity of the Republican field. With Parnell's exit, um, Republicans are looking for somebody who can become the standard bearer in 2022. Um, Oz is holding himself out there. Mr. McCormick, will, not formally declared yet, but moving in that McCormick, direction, yeah. is uh, it will hold himself out there. We have another. You know, the rest of the field that includes um, Jeff Bardos, the the former lieutenant governor candidate from 2018, Kathy Barnett, um, a conservative commentator, and a cast of thousands. It seems right. like. Um, you know, this is a, as we, as we were saying off set a moment ago, I mean, this is a must win seat, uh, could very well, it actually not could very well, will determine the balance of the a balance of power, power in the Senate yeah. in 2022. Um, so both sides are vying for it, uh, quite viciously. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's too hard to predict. I mean, some of the <clears> early, <throat> not just speculation, but a poll showed Oz with a lead, but this has a long way to go yet. And who knows what's what's likely to develop? Oz has been. They say they called him a carpetbagger. They said that some of the supplements he pushed and some of his medical advice has not been how do I put it uh, correct or proper. Um, I believe some people called him a snake oil salesman as well. I mean, yeah. Val Arcouche, who is a who is a physician. 
um, seems to have found uh, her, her, her lane with Dr. Oz and has been hammering him pretty consistently um, about, his, uh, about his medical qualifications. She's taking great umbrage that this guy is in the race when she considers herself um, sort of the legitimate physician and, uh, and scientist in, in the race. Yeah, well, as I say, the story has not yet been told, but we're going to follow it along with most of the national press corps. Yep. All right, John, let's talk a little bit about the governor's race. We did it in last week's program, and it's another subject that week after week after week, it's going to provide breaking news. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little quiet at the moment. Um, you know, you have Attorney General Josh Shapiro, who's sort of the... I mean, there are other Democrats who have jumped in, but he is, of course, sort of the most megawattage name um, in the race right now. On the Republican side of the ledger, you've got um, Senate President Pro Tempore uh, Jake Corman, you have former U.S. Rep uh, Lou Barletta, Bill McSwain, the former federal prosecutor from, uh, from Philadelphia, and others who are seeking the Republican nomination. Um, you have a pretty interesting undercard race now for uh, Lieutenant Governor on the Democratic side of things. Uh, State Representative Austin Davis, who's from out, uh, out there in the, the Mon Valley in Pittsburgh, um, has jumped in with the endorsement of Mr. Shapiro. Uh, Brian Sims, the Democrat from Philadelphia, State Representative from Philadelphia, is also seeking the nomination. Um, and then on the Republican side, an old name that is new again, uh, former State Rep Jeff Coleman is there seeking the GOP nod. All right, thanks for coming on. We'll have you back. We're going to do a lot of updates. All right, coming up, let's chat about emergency care after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by Cross State Credit Union Association. Credit unions, where people are worth more than money. To find a credit union that is right for you, go to ibelong.org. And by the Energy Association of Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's energy information source. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Association of Pennsylvania State College and University Faculties, representing the faculty and coaches who are devoted to providing quality public higher education for Pennsylvania's college students. Welcome back. Well, Dr. Todd Fieschi joins me. He's the Pennsylvania Medical Society hospital-based trustee, and I'll tell you what, uh, this is a, an extremely important topic, uh, and we're dealing with emergency care and, and the significance of it. Well, doctor, welcome to the program. Uh, on behalf of the Pennsylvania Medical Society and myself, I want to thank you for having us on today. Oh, it's our pleasure. All right, well, let's start with some important questions. How does someone know whether or not they need hospital care? I know that seems like an evident, self-evident question, but it's not. So with the many choices that we have today and the fact we're going through in a pandemic of COVID and we're starting into the, the flu season, it's a very important question. Um, patients should seek care in the emergency department when they feel they are experiencing life or limb threatening illness or injury, or when they're referred by their primary care physician or any other healthcare professional. We do everything in the emergency department, so it's a wide variety of cases that we see on a daily basis. Examples of symptoms that should immediately come to the emergency department include, but really would not be limited to in any way, chest pain, difficulty breathing, abdominal pain, head trauma, loss of consciousness, seizures, stroke and stroke-like symptoms, severe headaches, severe weakness, inability to ambulate, mental status changes, dehydration, psychiatric emergencies, severe bleeding, burns, broken bones, other trauma, and sometimes fever. And fever is very important because as I said, we have the COVID pandemic and we have the influenza season. COVID is tricky because symptoms may be initially mild but significantly worse in between days eight and 12. So a lot of people when they are initially diagnosed with COVID have a fever and a cough and don't really require an emergency department visit. But somewhere around days eight to 12, their breathing can deteriorate and they need to come see us. Well, well I'll tell you, flu, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. 
Well, I was going to say, so what basically you're saying is that uh, there are symptoms that a patient should seek hospital care for, and then there are symptoms that a patient should seek urgent care for, and then there's symptoms that they can be treated at home for. I mean, basically, there's those three elements to them. Do I got that correct? Uh, absolutely. And don't even forget telehealth visits or visits with your primary care physician in addition to those those other three avenues. And that's emerged as telehealth as really, really important given distances, given COVID, uh, all of those problems. That seems like that's been growing by leaps and bounds, correct or not? It, it certainly has, and I feel it's going to continue to grow um, as we have more people find that the easier way to access healthcare. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, another aspect of this is if somebody who doesn't need emergency care shows up in an emergency care unit, that takes away the time, the energy, and the resources that someone with the emergency care would need. That's why, that's another reason why this subject is so important. Yeah. When anyone comes to the emergency department, there's a limited number of physicians, nurses, and rooms for them to be seen in. And if anyone comes to the emergency department, wait times will go up and they are exceedingly high at this point. So you need to be prepared to have a long wait time when coming to the emergency department, especially if you're coming for a less severe illness or injury. We are filling up with patients that's having more life-threatening reactions to COVID, right. flu, and there's also a shortage of healthcare workers at this time. Yeah. Being that the more people that come, it could be harmful and even fatal if patients with a life-threatening illness can't be seen quickly or get into the emergency department because we currently have no beds right. available. Right. Well, let's, when we come back, we're going to run to a break. First come, first served. How do hospitals determine that? And obviously, that we're talking about um, med medical examinations and a medical purpose. We'll get to that after these words. This broadcast of Pennsylvania Newsmakers is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Medical Society. Inspired physicians committed to the good health of Pennsylvanians and the advancement of the practice of medicine. Well, the important question obviously is who, how do hospitals determine who gets seen first, doctor? So the ED triage system is not first come, first serve, and it can't be. Patients with the most severe ailments will be seen and treated first. Unfortunately, if you have a less severe illness or injury, you may have an extensive wait time until you're seen. For example, a broken toe, a mild fever, a small laceration, will always have to wait versus patients with stroke symptoms or chest pain or inability to breathe. That being yeah. said, you can never avoid emergency care if you feel you need that care, right. just because of concerns of wait times. Well, given COVID-19, it's my understanding, and, and you're, you're the expert, that the wait time for what I would call non-emergency uh, situations is much longer than it was before. Is that, I hear that all the time. Is that correct or not? Uh, the wait times have gone up exceedingly. Um, it is due to two things. Uh, one is certainly COVID-19. Other is some staffing shortages that we are having in our healthcare systems. Um, we have patients that we call boarding in the emergency department, meaning they are admitted to the hospital, but there are no beds to go upstairs to because the hospital is full. So they stay in the emergency department until beds are available. Well, what that does essentially is gives me a smaller emergency department. Those beds are unavailable to treat new and arriving patients. And I have to work out of a department that is holding admitted patients to go upstairs. Yeah. Well, obviously we're heading into flu season and it has to affect emergency departments and their activities, their capacity, their wait times. And it's contagious. And so obviously people, if they can, meaning they don't have a medical reason why they cannot, should get the flu shot. But that still has to have, if we have a horrific flu season, that can have a huge effect on 
you know, how, how hospitals, how the emergency departments handle that, uh, that problem? Absolutely. Wait times will continue to increase and go higher as more patients access the emergency department for care. Even before the COVID pandemic, emergency rooms typically see a spike in wait times and patients needing care during the flu season. Add this to the large amount of COVID patients and staff shortages, our health systems are in a bit of trouble. Same rules are going to apply to COVID and flu. You can be treated at home with over-the-counter medicines, rest, drinking plenty of fluids, and most importantly, avoiding public places and contact with others, unless you're experiencing serious symptoms. Those symptoms would include chest pain, difficulty breathing, dehydration, and mental status changes. But if you're having mild symptoms, please consider using telehealth or just taking your care of yourself at home with over-the-counter medications. Well, doctor, what precautions can Pennsylvanians take to avoid needing a hospital visit? That seems like an obvious question, but it's an important one. Hospitalization rates are soaring in Pennsylvania while hospital staffing is down. For the first two weeks of December, about 3,900 patients per day were hospitalized with COVID-19. This is up 50%. The primary reason for this is we still have 40% of Pennsylvanians unvaccinated. A long winter looms for doctors, nurses, and most importantly, the patients we serve. Additionally, to our COVID increases, many health systems are forced to delay elective surgery because there is not space available to bed and treat those patients. For instance, if you have bad knee arthritis and are waiting a knee replacement and you've been waiting for six months, this is gonna get delayed another two to three months until hospital volumes open up. Yeah. The best thing- No, go ahead, go ahead. Thing, no, go ahead. The best thing Pennsylvanians can do is get fully vaccinated, including their boosters, against COVID and also get their flu shot. This will lessen your chances of getting a severe case and having to go and use the hospital. We are all tired of COVID, especially healthcare workers, but it is not tired of us. We are ready to see this wave of Omicron patients. Social distancing, masking, and frequent hand washing remain cornerstones of what you can do at home to keep you from contracting COVID-19 and other illnesses. Taking these precautions will decrease your chances of needing a hospital visit and ultimately help frontline workers by freeing up waiting room and ICU bed space. Well, doctor, I, I want to thank you for coming in. I'll, I'll tell you something. This is the we've we've done a lot of important uh, medical issues on this program, but this is the first time we've done, you know, emergency departments and their and their critical needs. And you've spelled that all uh, 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 quite well. And again, I want to thank you. All right, we'll see you next week for another edition of Pennsylvania Newsmakers. And as always, thanks for watching.